Good evening, ladies and gentlemen of the world. Welcome. David Macmillan here in what will be part four of a little series following the adventures of two aspiring drug smugglers. How did this come about? Well, through you. Many complaints about the low quality of cocaine available. Hmm? It's always been a complaint. Well, it has been since the 70s anyway. But really, it spurred on a couple of people. Jed Pontiac and Kevin Block from the UK. Uh, Jed, sir, uh, he's not from the UK. He's from Ohio. But it spurred them to go out, go forth. Go west, young man? No, go south to Colombia. If you haven't been following any of this, well, I could suggest you go back and look. But if you're a person who, well, time is short and you're in a hurry, I'll bring you up to speed. Let's see here. We have Kevin Block. He's from Cambridge in the UK, and he's ended up in South America, seeking, well, not a huge amount, just a couple of kilos, really, and he wants to bring it back to London, where he has ready customers. Well, he thinks he does. And then there's Jed Pontiac from... Well, he was from Cleveland a while, but he's in Centerville anyway, Ohio. But he's not there any longer. He crossed the border at Mexico and then headed down to Colombia, first Cartagena, then Cali, and now with his girlfriend, Myra Pink. No, she's not dragging him down. Don't take that view, you silly people. No, she's helping him. In fact, she's found Karen. And Karen she found, well, or did Karen find her at a local supermarket of all places. And Karen's got contacts because Jed's, well, didn't pan out and somebody took his money and, well, had a good time with it. Didn't get Jed any kilos. No, no, no. Pity. Last we heard from Jed, he was waiting in a hotel room in Cali. The contact he has now through Karen is a, a good provider and has three kilos waiting for him. But Jed is waiting for his money, and it doesn't look like it's going to come in a hurry because it ended up, well, it ended up in the hands of um, end of days man, uh, Wayne Mange, who has other plans for it. So that's not coming. He needs to pay for three kilos, which was lined up with a woman who is quite a well-known figure in Cali. Yeah, she's... What would you call it? Mid-range dealer? I guess so. She could probably arrange a hundred kilos, but that doesn't happen every week. Now, her kind of customer, well, they're local people. They buy a kilo here and there and bang it out in bits. But the odd foreigner sneaks in there sometimes, and that piques everybody's interest. And you don't want too much interest in this kind of thing. We'll come back to Jed and his problems shortly, but let's take a look at Kevin. Last we heard from him, he'd been tangled up with, well, a group, a person we'll call uh, Pablo Rodriguez, who had arranged a bag for him, but not in Cali. No, he sent him down to Peru and had all intentions of having him head out from Lima Airport into Europe. Not an uncommon route at all. And part of that little scheme is to have the courier go to the kind of places that are most popular in Peru. And the most popular are the ruins at Machu Picchu, which is where Kevin ended up. But mm, low-lying fog and different changes in the atmosphere meant that Kevin missed his flight so he was pushed on to the next day, but Pablo didn't know that. And when there was a no-show from Kevin, Pablo thought, well, he thought what had happened so many times before, he'd lost another courier. Now, I can tell you this, if Pablo had been a first-time player, there would have been lots of investigating about uh, what happened to Kevin. Why was there not so much in this case? After all, he's lost an investment there. In fact, what he's lost is what he hoped to be, somebody really working for him, 
and Kevin didn't like that idea. He wants to be an independent smuggler, not just working as a donkey for some South American syndicate. No, he agreed to it, but reluctantly, and he wasn't entirely disappointed when not only did he miss his flight, but when he took one the next day and returned to the capital, Lima, there was no sign of Pablo. Yeah. He could have called, of course, but then again, he didn't, and wisely so, because the SIM card that Pablo had given him was the SIM card to end the careers and lives of so many. The cheapskate Pablo had kept that number simply because he remembered it without having to write it down and kept giving courier after courier the same one. Of course, <clears throat> that uh, number had to be reissued several times because uh, on three occasions couriers had actually had that SIM card on them at the time they were arrested. Yeah, Pablo's lost many. Men, women, God knows what. But... <laughs> Well, let's not get distracted in Pablo, because he's a kind of rough-headed-looking guy, I'd have to tell you, but he's a trier. He, he can pick himself up after a knockdown and just keep going. But here, Kevin is now on his own. Still has the suitcase with uh, what is almost four kilos of good cocaine inside, packed and mixed into the plastic of a Samsonite case. Yeah. Tap it, you won't know it's there. It, if you haven't uh, followed any of the bits of chemistry before, is simply cocaine dissolved in alcohol, reduced down to a paste, then uh, compressed, um, or really formed as a mold into the shape of a suitcase shell, the outside. So there's no smell, and it feels like plastic because mostly, mostly it is. Uh, there's little fibres in there that were black but now grey. And quite solid, too. You could chew it, but you wouldn't get much out of it. He has booked himself on a flight from uh, Lima through to Madrid. Yeah, they're sure there are other European destinations, but not one with so many flights. And here's the important thing. It was a wise choice because there's the language in common, isn't there, with Colombia? So it's natural that Colombians would fly into a Spanish-speaking world. So it's not like flying into London from Bogota or something like that. There aren't a huge number of them, but it's almost routine into Madrid. Sure, the Customs and Narcotics Police in Spain know all about that, and they're a bit wary too. But that's a good thing to be said for numbers. Though these... <laughs> These adventures are in COVID times, so everything's a little bit different on that score. But still, Kevin is about to head out for uh, Lima Airport and then board a flight which will take him to Madrid, transit, and then on to Portugal. Yes, Lisbon. And he's been advised to do that by uh, someone, most mornings, whose name escapes me. But we'll come back to him soon. He's just heading for the airport now. Jed Pontiac, uh, with Myra, Pink, is back in Cali. He hasn't much mood from there because he's waiting on $6,000 that he expects from a friend of a friend, Wayne Mange. Well, he'll wait a long time because Wayne, he found something more important to do with it, something that Wayne feels destiny has made him made him the messenger from the heavens, really, on this one. And he's heading east, east towards the land of Washington, yes. That's not going to help uh, Jed at all. What's he going to do? Jed's girlfriend, Myra, steps in to save the day. Really almost unbeknownst to him, because Jed probably would have pawned it by now, Myra has a watch, a Cartier de Pantera. I think that's how you say it. But anyway, it's the diamond-encrusted version. She estimates its value at about $30,000 and doesn't wear it very often because she, th she thinks that somebody will relieve her of it, and they probably would. Oh, where did it come from with little Myra? Well, <clears throat> back in her pink hair days... She used to be, 
She was quite adventurous in a different field. She had lots of, uh, I guess you'd used to call them gentlemen callers. No, oh, we shouldn't put her down for that. But one of them installed her in a, an apartment somewhere. Oh, yes, to be 18 again. Everything seems better that way. Well, it was at least 12 years ago from Mari's point of view now. But she was installed in an apartment, and that was a parting gift. Yeah, Quite touching, really. I mean, say what you will about somebody accepting uh, gifts uh, in a peculiar relationship with a much older gentleman. But, but a watch still has some sentiment. There's time going by. And so Myra produces the watch so that in Colombia, Jed will have the money to pay for the coke. She gets Karen to turn that watch into money. Karen does admire the watch. Oh, by the way, did I tell you? It's a man's watch. And uh, <clears throat> I think I got the name wrong. But that doesn't matter. And how she came to have a man's... Oh, look, let's leave the past alone, shall we? Let's kind of move along. If we dig through everybody's past, and you know yourself, what a mire you will find. Karen takes the watch, kind of drags him around a couple of shops, I don't know what that's for, for show, and then says she has somebody who can lend on it, and on, on their next trip to Columbia it can be redeemed. That made Myra pretty happy. It was of sentimental value to her, of course. Extraordinarily enough, Karen returns with but three thousand dollars. Well, <clears throat> Myra's not uh, not at all happy with that. Jesus fucking crap! Well, I, w I won't repeat what she said, but she nonetheless accepted that the watch could be uh, returned. But three thousand was that any good? Well, according to Karen, yes, because Karen good friend now to Jed and Myra, she'll put in the rest. Yeah, She'll put in 3,000 of her own money. And, uh, well, what does that make her? I guess it makes her a 50% partner in some senses. Yeah. I should really take a moment to uh, <clears throat> wonder about 50% partnerships in different locations in the world. If you and a friend open a restaurant and put up half the money each and work hard, both of you, and reap the reward, yes, you can say half of the profits go to each person. But what if you're in another country and the money, this 50%, is not for travel expenses, it's not for your whole life, it's not for your fee in endangering yourself carrying narcotics. It is just for the stock. Ask yourself, how does that make that person a full partner in the proceeds. Hmm. Not only that, wherever the cocaine goes to, it has to be sold. That person selling it, receiving the money, is going to have to deal with somebody who is, well, let's not mince words, a drug trafficker. And that in itself would put in some kind of money incentive. Again, another layer. But I'll tell you this. Anybody, really, in a source country who manages to convince you that they have 50% involvement in something expects they have 50% of your entire life's earnings forever. It's just something to bear in mind. Oh, and by the way, um, Karen didn't put up a dime. No, 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 that $3,000 was all talk because she knew that the Coke actually only cost half of the $6,000 that she originally quoted from Madam the Dealer. Yes, sad really. But talk and a bit of flash has bought her a partnership. It hasn't been discussed how that will kind of break down when the Coke is sold. This is all the stuff of various people's dreams at the moment. But uh, because Jed doesn't really have a way out of town with it. No, not yet. Many people say Kevin is a bit slow, but he's really just a slow thinker. And he took a fast taxi to Lima Airport early in the morning of his flight to Spain. 
arrived and didn't like the vibe, didn't like what he saw. And what did he see? He saw what you get at Lima Airport. Some plain kind of police, some officials, some obvious men and women with badges and guns and tight uniforms. But he was, well, kind of tuned into the world enough to see that there were many other kinds of snoops. A kind of curtain of them, you could say. Yeah, people who worked for, well, worked for the downfall of all smugglers. Did he board his flight? No, he didn't. No, no, I'll give it to Kevin. What he did was retrace his journey. He left International and went to the domestic section of the airport. Kevin, in the domestic section of uh, Lima Airport, took one of the dedicated phones there to the airline. And, uh, was it Avianca? It may have been. <clears throat> And he called through feigning illness and put himself onto a, a flight the next day. Well, what was to gain? Going out the next day wouldn't help very much. Sure, it was uh, one of the last uh, flights out from uh, Lima to Madrid in the day. But that change from morning to uh, late evening wouldn't mean anything, would it? Well, it did, because Kevin took his bag and then he flew back up to Cozco. Oh, sorry, Cuzco. Got to get that right. Cuzco is where the, uh, it's not far uh, from the, uh, the famous ruins that everybody goes to see. And he, he flew there to Cuzco so that he could take the last flight back. He did, and he did that the next day. And when he boarded, he pointed out that he had a connection to uh, the Madrid flight at Lima. And the connection time was something like an hour and 15 minutes. It is every day, and yet his flight was leaving at 4.30, the last flight out of Cusco. So the airline being nice people and Kevin looking very nerdy, they tagged his bag not just to Lima, but with a double tag right through to Madrid. Now, Kevin has a ticket that takes him to Portugal. Or, um, in fact, Lisbon. They could have triple tagged that bag. That would have been a nice dream. So the bag would have disappeared down the chute into the cargo hold of the domestic flight, been transferred at, uh, uh, in Lima and onto another aircraft and then transferred again in Spain. Wow, at Madrid onto Portugal. He wouldn't have even seen that bag if he'd had a triple transfer, but he didn't. Airlines are a bit funny about that. They lose baggage sometimes. It's a bit of pressure um, on the transit connection and the baggage handling things, and having three three-letter codes on the same tag. But nonetheless, it's good. Why? Because <laughs> Kevin, when he flies on the 430 flight and arrives at about 6.37, and at uh, Lima, he doesn't have to go and collect a bag and drag it back over to um, the international departure section. No, he's uh, already checked in in that sense. So it's perfect. He does that, he walks through, and he sees most, but not all, the same kind of morning spook faces. You know, the customs people, those dark, swarthy types that rather have you handcuffed to an uncomfortable chair in a back windowless room somewhere. He saw a few of those, but not so many. And the lightness he felt at not being around that bag, because he knew it was already in transit, being boarded on his flight, gave him that rosy glow of uh, floating inertia that carries you through at an airport. And he boarded his flight to Spain unhindered, though taking the risk of turning into a pillar of salt, he turned around at Lima to see what the dark types were pouncing on. Yes, the dark-hearted ones had pounced on a couple of people, Kevin noticed, but not he. No. 
No, he didn't turn into a pillar of salt. He's hoping to look something like one in uh, about 16 hours, counting a couple of uh, transit connections, but not quite yet. Let's change countries to where they both came in. We're back in Cali in Colombia, and Jed and Myra are uh, the proud new owners of three kilos of Colombian. Well, it's actually not Colombian. It was made down in Ecuador and uh, bears the, the falcon crest of one of the manufacturers there. Now, this stuff arrived, as it usually does when buying um, from a local retailer, as it were, in a big brick, uh, about the size of a, mm, two trade paperbacks. A little chauvinistic of me to choose a, a literary subject there, but large paperbacks, about four to 800 pages. So imagine that. That's your kilo, and a little bulkier. Covered in, it's, it's, it's cling-wrapped, yes, but it's also covered in a kind of rubber sheeting, very thin and heat-sealed, always made to withstand being dumped in the ocean or uh, dropped in a bath somewhere. They're kind of thoughtful, really, when you consider it. But mostly it's for the humidity, in fact. It has to keep out the air because it doesn't travel well. That's your brick of cocaine. <clears throat> Unless we're carrying it, of course. <clears throat> no. He looks on in wonder at that. And very tempted is he, in fact, too tempted, on the pretext of checking it out. And I must admit, I, I've weakened in such a way. I cut a little flap in one of the bricks, just like Jed did. Or was it Myra? I think she actually had the knife in her hand, as a one-inch square flap was cut out. And <clears throat> in the interest of good business, it was checked thoroughly and well into the night. <laughs> Come morning, the now tired checkers of quality started to stir, realizing it's in fact afternoon, and having a small discussion over the kind of liquids you can keep down when you'd be naughty. It seems that, well, Karen had the idea that Jed had a pretty good plan of how to travel with this stuff. And I guess he, he did, but the plan was not his own. He'd heard about its dissolving properties and, and thought he could dissolve it into bottles. It's really a bit much to be putting in bottles at three kilos. Too many bottles. And of what, really? No, no. It'd get in there, but it would get found, too. So our intrepid first-time smugglers... Jed and now Myra too, have no plan of how to get it out. Will Karen help? Of course she will. She's a partner now, isn't she? Yes. Alwyn, a good checker. She was up all night checking. <laughs> Karen, uh, a thoughtful young woman, and despite having been found in a supermarket, like many a famous person. Who was it? Was it Debbie Harry? Oh, no, the singer out of Bow Wow Wow. Anyway, Mal Malcolm McLaren, he, he could spot talent, couldn't he? <clears throat> Karen has a solution to how to travel with her cocaine. She wants Jed to uh, find a friend who is a little on the chubby side, and um, he will be supplied with a jelly belly. What's that? Well, if you've heard me rattle on about concealments before, you will have heard of the process by which somebody not completely fat is made to appear quite fat by the installation of a rubber latex silicon concoction that makes like a fat belly, and the cocaine is hidden inside. Now, when this first came out, it was kind of rough-ass sort of thing, and... Uh, well, there were still basically blocks inside um, a latex and sponge, a bit of blubber that went under somebody's clothes. It didn't work very well and certainly never survived the uh, modern form of x-rays at the bigger airports. 
No, that wouldn't do. But uh, Karen's an enterprising friend who knows all about it, understands that you not liquefy, but when you li liquefy the cocaine, but then reduce it down to a smooth, but very, very thick, kind of um, almost like a paste, this then gets sealed inside uh, uh, an extracted rubber. A bit like, the, imagine holding a, a hot water bottle, you know, moves around and it's kind of squishy. The shampoo consistency cocaine, which is now at about a 2.5 to 1 ratio, so he needs to have about, well, well, 7 or 8 kilos of blubber stuck on him, this fat guy that Jed supposedly knows, or hopes to know, and have that strapped to his body, and then extra la another layer, a little layer of sponge. So you can imagine, this is the effect. When this belly is in place, somebody has to be able to touch it, and like your own flesh, spring back, unless you're one of those six-pack types that don't spring anywhere, just throb, <clears throat> but spring back like mortal flesh, and also have a kind of outer layer which is not spongy exactly. Spongy is too much spring. It's quite a set of uh, levels to go through, but you um, <clears throat> will say the jelly belly under, then a, a about five centimeters of sponge, uh, then latex of a form, but not latex itself. Go down to Tarantis and check on the, the combinations of rubbers they have there. You'll, you'll find what you're looking for. Anyway, we won't get bogged down in that because Jed doesn't know a fat guy. Well, not one that's to hand. He knows plenty of them back in the car dealership where he, uh, he sold his... Um, <clears throat> doctored up motors. No, but there's none to hand. But Jed won't be stopped. He wasn't stopped in Mexico City, and he wasn't stopped up in Cartagena, and he won't be stopped now in Cali. He will become the fat man. He will wear the jelly belly. Actually, much to Myra's amusement rather than dismay. But your neck, but your chin... Well, much is to be done to the appearance of Jed Pontiac to turn him into a fat man. More than just some fat suit underneath some skinny man's clothes. Some work. Hello, travellers. Let's turn our attention now to Kevin, who is landing at Madrid Airport. And he has to pick up his case. And he's come from Lima. Sure, he's packed his bags with some touristy bits of crap, but honestly, people, you know perfectly well that if you find yourself on a special counter with the two customs personnel sifting through your crap, the appearance there of a guidebook to uh, the customs of the native South American practices of the Incas and the Aztecs is not going to save you from a uh, certain destruction. But... Kevin was lucky. Well, I say luck, but I think it's Kevin's survival instinct. He, uh, on that final leg in, he, he gravitated towards somebody kind of nerd-like, and he found a fellow gamer, and also a, a Spanish national. And all that was very useful. So, on arrival, they flew in, cleared immigration together. Well, you see, Spain and the UK are part of the European Union. But uh, I say that <clears throat> hesitatingly, because if I don't get this to air soon, we no longer will be. Now, if you're part of the European Union, you travel through EU borders altogether, and you have nothing much to declare. Now, sure, this flight is outside of Europe, but you are arriving as a united European very soon, it looks like uh, the UK will appear to have left the European Union. And after a bit of fussing around, 
Britons will have to line up with other foreigners in EU places. Yes, in France, in Italy. It's a sad day, really. It's a triumph of uh, petty, childish, teenage rebelliousness that turned to soggy porridge reality with leaving the European Union. No sense to it whatsoever. Just a whim. But it carried in the... Uh, by what was it? Less than 3% or something? Madness. <clears throat> oh, it was uh, only a referendum, mind you. It, it, if you're watching this from the United States, uh, you don't have them, but they uh, have them a lot in Europe and, and very rarely in the UK because normally governments are not stupid enough to ask the people what they think. They go on all the time in Switzerland, for example. It's almost like ancient Greece. They decide on just about every matter by lots of voting on issues. No, no, some clod asked Britons whether they want to be part of a, a union of 27 European countries. And of course, everybody, not everybody, but at least half of the people said no, just for the hell of it. It's a, a British characteristic, saying things for the hell of it. Well, it's biting us on the ass now. Anyway, not quite yet. So Kevin and his gamer friend, who is a Spanish speaker, um, clear through immigration and then pick up their bags and go through the uh, nothing-to-declare exits without being touched. In fact, there was really nobody on that day. Uh, in Spain, things are pretty tough and uh, they often don't have that little, um, what would you call it, roving narcotics inspection teams on. So I wouldn't fuss too much about Madrid Airport. Look, sure, they have their rest, and I think uh, Kevin would have been wise to fly in a few times to familiarize himself. It's a huge airport, and modern, cost a lot of money, just about deserted at the moment, and it certainly was when uh, Kevin and his new friend arrived. But he found himself in Spain, with his kilos in a bag. A slight problem, it's actually in the case itself, not the bag. Oh, and he has to fly on to Portugal, yeah. Um, it turned out that somebody, being friendly in the airline, actually checked on his bag to Lisbon. He had in mind dumping that part of the ticket. But if fate had that intended, he'll fly on to Lisbon. After all, it's only an hour and a bit away. He's inside the European. It's uh, part of the customs union, this... Well, what could possibly go wrong? Yes, nothing at all. But we'll leave Kevin, shall we, for the moment? Because Jed is trying on his fatware. Jed's new rubber and compound cocaine belly has arrived after a bit of fussing around and pushing the limits of the visa that uh, Jed and Myra have up to uh, 26 days, I think they're at now, and, and you don't want to be going getting extensions, not in places like this, and not in times like this, not without a, a sensible reason. And there isn't any, I can tell you. No, they've got to get out of town, and the belly doesn't look right. Jed's tried on suits, he's tried on jumpers, and it's kind of hot. You wouldn't travel like that. But Myra, yeah, I mean, she's turning out to be kind of the heroine of this thing, isn't she? She had an idea, it's the artist in her, I like to think, of stripping Jed down, just the belly. Oh, and by the way, it, it's held at the shoulders with uh, kind of more bits of rubber, but nonetheless, it's distinguishably like a, a strip of rubber. It may be flesh-colored, but it looks like the top of a bra and on a man. Well, you have to cover that bit, whatever you're wearing. But Myra has decided that though <laughs> Jed has been made to look fat in various ways, not fat, but as, as porky as he, he can by um, <clears throat> a cosmetician, he has to be careful of sweating because if you're wearing that much uh, plastic covering over your body and it's already hot, you're, you're going to sweat. So any makeup job to thicken your neck is, is not... Well, it'll work, but it, it works about the same amount of time as it does on stage, a couple of hours, and uh, it's all over. 
I had a moustache once that was drooping over my lower lip. It was all right. When I snored, it flapped. Anyway. Ms. Pink's inspiration was to have Jed wear a, a Hawaiian shirt. Yes? Stands out, florid, colourful, you know, pineapples and nonsense all over it. Parrots, I think, on this one. And have it about a size and a half, maybe two, too small. This was her theory, that chubby people don't like to be considered overweight. So when they go to a shop, they buy clothing that's not the right size, but in their minds, their size. And that's how they get about. And so it's not unusual to see somebody wearing a shirt that's a bit small for them. Now, you can overdo it when it comes to uh, wearing jelly bellies. I mean, you wear something ridiculous. Uh, but nonetheless, it rather worked well. There was a little stretch at the front buttons. And what's the point of this? The thing is, when Jed would go through security, he wouldn't have any metal on him, sure. But if it came to a pat-down you would know that that Hawaiian shirt is pressed against the flesh. It's already pressed against the body. He's not concealing anything. It wouldn't matter if he was patted down. No. And clearly, because of that stretch, he hasn't got anything hidden upon him. Oh, and he's got shorts on as well. Patted out a little to make a kind of porky ass to go with that, uh, that belly. But... <laughs> Some modifications were made. It had to be more decent beer gut, nearer on a pregnant man than a jelly belly on a fat guy. But you know Jed is going to do this. You know Myra will be behind him. She won't be quivering in the wings. She's not that kind of person. Not like, uh, oh, I didn't tell you about, uh, well... Kevin, mm. yeah, way back, way back, way back, way back, his girlfriend was always worried about his little adventures here. She knew about it. <clears throat> oh, Carrie Colonic is her name. She knew that Kevin was off on a mission, but he's going by himself. She's not invited, not to be put in danger, said Kevin, whether he meant that or just didn't want her around, it's hard to say. But she's fretting at home, especially now that uh, she hasn't heard from him for a while. Fretting an awful lot. Hmm. Is that a bad thing? Of course it is for the poor girl, Carrie. But it could be worse for Kevin. You remember he's about to get on a flight to Portugal. <clears throat> but he hasn't called Carrie. Oh, no. Call the girl in your life. Call the man in your life. Or at least think about it. Yes, Englishman Kevin has not been keeping his girlfriend. Carrie up to date on his travels. Uh, really quite sensibly, you don't want to be talking on phone lines about your next move at an international airport. Not if you're smuggling narcotics. So he hasn't. Especially in the last mm, post-Pablo phase, when he shed himself of the encumbrance of having been acting pretty much as a mule for a Colombian syndicate working out of Lima in Peru. He hasn't called her, but she knew about that connection. And then this silence. Now, he went radio silent on the sound belief that when you're actually traveling, you don't communicate because that communication leaves a trail. But Carrie's been worried so worried that she thinks he's done the job for the uh, Colombians and somehow been set aside. <laughs> well, that doesn't really happen. Well, not on run one, anyway. Uh, yeah. But it's enough worry for Carrie to feel she has to confide in, in somebody. And who is the somebody in whom she confides regularly? It is Bradley, her brother. Bradley. Always a good ear, often a big mouth.
Bradley, brother of Carrie, works in government. Yes, he's in some government department. It's the uh, trade section of the Foreign Affairs Office. Um, he wears his job lightly, as it were. He doesn't like to think of himself being a government toady. Takes it easy. Well, he's just a bit lazy at work. Besides, Bradley's her brother. What she feels, he must feel, surely. Anyway, Bradley is... Is he a hipster? Well, he smokes a bit of weed, has had the odd line. But let's look at him a little bit more closely before considering whether he is the right person to be talking to. And Bradley, at 32, should have some kind of maturity, an air of that anyway. But nonetheless, he doesn't. He carries himself like somebody in early 20s. He uh, changes his style of dressing from year to year, depending on the crowd he's involved with. Now, <clears throat> Carrie has decided that perhaps Bradley knows somebody who, on the quiet, can make inquiries about uh, what might have happened to Kevin if something unfortunate has, you know, foreign office and all that. But uh, perhaps at the, it's the wrong phase in Bradley's life. Now, sure, as I said, he... Uh, He's had the odd line or two of coke, but that's a far thing from smuggling it. And, well, he's one of those people that, if it's his little bag of coke, his little cokey-wokey, he chops it up on a table to share with friends. Oh, he oh, chops it up endlessly with a credit card. You can hear this going on forever. Those friends are wilting as the minutes pass by when Bradley makes such a big show of it. Well, he doesn't so much anymore. But, you know, a guy like that, surely you could trust. Except that Bradley has started to dress yet differently again. His jumpers are less baggy. He's a little bit neater here and there. And is that the growings, uh, the shadings of a moustache appearing on Bradley's upper lip? What could his new friends be? Yes. Mm, they're policemen. Bradley uh, has decided that in the mean, in the style of an older and wise brother, he will, instead of making discreet inquiries through the foreign office in which he works, he will tell his police friends. Why? Because he thinks that will uh, help Kevin in some way? No. Because, like the crawler, he's always been. Like the, like the faddest, like the proto-hipster he never quite became. He wants to impress his friends, and there's nothing like a story about a, a smuggler in motion that will impress his police friends. It doesn't impress them quite as much as you might think, and you will find in episode five. But still, things happen. And after all, Kevin is in the air and heading for Portugal. What's been happening the previous 48 hours? And what will that do to him? Back to Cali. Are we at Cali Airport? Do we watch uh, Jed walk in as the fat man? Hawaiian shirt? Carrie? boarding separately. Oh, she's going to travel with him, but not uh, like checking in together. No, no, no. Uh, she fearful of arrest? No, no, of course not. She explained to Jed that she could be more help if she too were not arrested at the same moment, so they should pretend not to know each other and they made their tickets separate. Wise, wise, wise. But here's the thing. If Jed had boarded at Cali Airport dressed as the fat man, that would be the end of Jed. He would never survive it because at Cali, the foreign devils and a few locals are directed almost at every point of departure. They're directed into a room which has a full body um, light uh, backscatter x ray machine. Yes, it doesn't penetrate right through to another screen, but it bounces off. And 
the jelly belly would have been detected. But somebody wisely, on hearing about this, advised Jed that, yes, travelling separately might be something, but not as much as travelling from somewhere else. So they've gone up to Barranquilla. Yep, and the flight they're taking is one to Curaçao. A sensible flight, an interesting flight, a short flight to the hmm, Dutch Antilles is Curaçao, Holiday Island, uh, north of Colombia. And principally why? Because Barranquilla doesn't have one of these irritating machines. Uh, sure, they have um, little attacks from time to time of the uh, army-like anti-narcotics police, but no technology to speak of. And luckily for us, we don't want our stories ending too soon, Jed makes it through, and arm in arm with Myra. She's sticking close. Jen and Myra spend very little time in Curaçao, which is just as well, because there are some interesting characters who might notice them. And without having to change out of this very awkward fat suit, well, not suit, but belly, fly on on a longer and somewhat more sweaty flight to St. Martin, the uh, jointly held Dutch and French island in the Leeward Islands, I think they are. No, oh, that's not true. Windward Islands. Nice place. And they've landed there safely, of course, because there's virtually no customs in St. Martin. Now, he had to shed the suit. The Hawaiian shirt and the belly. He could stand the heat no longer. Suiting up once again, Two days later, after staying well, very pleasantly at a place called St. Mary's Boon, just by the, not far from the airport it is, it's on the Dutch side. Good rooms, straight onto the beach. Anyway, after a couple of uh, breezy days there, they're heading off on a flight back to the United States. And this is a flight heading back to Cleveland. Well, that was the plan. But the flight is from St. Martin to Atlanta in Georgia. There was kind of nothing else going, run by Delta Airlines, or so it seemed. Something, well, something in Myra's past made her feel quite uncomfortable with travelling further with Jed, so they did split up this time. And Jed boarded the, uh, well, it, it, he thought it was Delta, but it's actually run by Endeavour Air. And it's uh, not such a big aeroplane. I think it holds about 90. Um, it's a Bombardier, Mitsubishi aircraft. Quite small, a little bit on the uncomfortable side, I'd say, but also for Jed, seven hours sitting in this damn lump of plastic. <sighs> the air conditioning helped a little bit, but not a great deal. Fortunately, this time of the year, it's pretty cool in Atlanta. Pretty cool. Pretty cold, in fact. Jed arrives. Does he get through? Of course he does. A few things going on and so much fuss about viruses and things and masks and... Uh, well, he sailed through, as the good ship Jed did. And the precaution of Myra travelling separately onto Cleveland, it was a needless one. And one perhaps she might regret, for... Jed couldn't stand that suit a moment longer. He left there at Atlanta, checked into a motel, took off the jelly billy, threw it into a suitcase, and took a long shower. He would drive on back to Ohio. He liked the idea of a good road trip. Myra might not approve. We'll find out in episode five. So our two intrepid first-time smugglers have kind of made it. They've returned to the Western world anyway, though really Columbia is the West when you look at it, but nonetheless return to their, close to their home places. Uh, Jed is in uh, 
Georgia, going to drive over to uh, Ohio, and, uh, well, Kevin's just landing at uh, Portugal as the last message I got. But there's a little bit of trouble because his uh, dear Carrie, his girlfriend, has confided in Bradley, uh, hoping that Bradley would help, but all he's done is rat the guy out, which you should expect for somebody who's so faddish and fusses around with his little chopped up fucking lines. No, anyway, let's not get back to people I don't like. <clears throat> so he could have a problem on landing in uh, Lisbon. But we'll find out as the trail goes on. And, oh, oh, I see somebody out there. Well, one of you, anyway, is wondering what happened to Wayne Mange, the one who, in case you missed it last time, had a plan of um, assassinating Joe Biden, president-elect, so that uh, the only remaining candid candidate, uh, Donald Trump, would uh, keep his seat in the Oval Office. How did that go? Not very well. Um, not too sure what uh, he really needed um, Jed's money for, but uh, he ended up buying a camper trailer. And the attempt involved some master plan where uh, Wayne could get into a, a place where security wouldn't bother him because it would be plain that he had no weapons uh, just by looking at him. And he, he'd lined up a, a little... <laughs> little moment. Now, Wayne Mange knew perfectly well that the president-elect would be draped with heavy security, that no one who looked remotely dangerous, and certainly not somebody who was carrying a weapon, could approach. So his plan was to get close enough to the president-elect without getting intercepted by being plainly unarmed. He'd, in fact, uh, hidden a gun in a fire hose box where he expected uh, Joe Biden to pass by. He thought he'd be able to get to that box, open it, and get the weapon. He'd get out of his car and walk straight across the road and cross paths within about 20 feet. It was an interesting plan, and perhaps would have worked quite well, except for one thing. Wayne got out of his car, well... He was plainly unarmed, and he did walk across the street and headed rather quickly in the general direction of the president-elect. He was a bit surprised that, in fact, the security people, in fact, one of the local police, turned on him and aimed a weapon straight away. And why was this? Because Wayne was naked. He thought a naked man would be noticeable for its strangeness, but not considered dangerous. He shouldn't have broken into a run. And in the haste, well, the officer who shot him thought he was armed. For Wayne had forgotten one thing that he was still wearing. His colostomy bag. Poor Wayne. No one will ever know how deeply he felt. If you survive Christmas with uh, all those mouthfuls of dry turkey, I already told you to get beef. Well, you can join me for part five, just after Christmas. Well, sometime after Christmas anyway. In which we will see how our true intrepid travellers get on as they return to their home countries. Or certainly home territories, as they try to. See you soon.